The human spinal column is made up of five distinct sections divided by 33 bones. There are seven vertebrae in the cervical region, 12 in the thoracic region, five in the lumbar region, five in the sacral region, and four in the coccygeal region. At the top of the structure where your head intersects and attaches to the column are more highly specialized and unique vertebrae, the atlas and axis. As the names denote, the atlas vertebrae, from the Greek god that holds up the world, holds up and supports the structure of the skull, and the axis vertebrae allows rotating articulation of the head. The 33 vertebrae number is a general rule that allows for the common enough anatomical variation of one additional vertebrae, or one less, usually in the thoracic region. This can be identified in some cases by observing someone who is shorter than you while standing, but taller when you both sit down, or in the reverse, a person who is taller while standing, yet shorter when you both are seated. Each of the vertebrae forming the spinal column have several articulating facets, which are also used for muscle attachment. There is also a hole at center through which the spinal cord passes. The spinal discs consist of the nucleus pulpus and the annulus fibrosus. A spinal stenosis, the abnormal narrowing of a passage, can lead to several conditions that may require treatment. These can include herniated disc, bulging disc, degenerative disc disease, arthritis, spondylolisthesis, and malalignment. Herniated discs are a fairly common condition that most people are familiar with. According to the Mayo Clinic, this condition can cause irritation in the nearby nerves and result in pain, numbness, or weakness in the arms and legs. On the other hand, many people experience no symptoms from a herniated disc. Most people who have a herniated disc don't need surgery to correct the problem. Most herniated discs occur in your lower back or lumbar spine although they can occur in your neck, the cervical spine. If your herniated disc is in your lower back, you'll typically feel the most intense pain in your buttocks, thigh, and calf. It may also involve part of the foot. If your herniated disc is in your neck, the pain will typically be most intense in the shoulder and arm. This pain may shoot into your arm or leg when you cough, sneeze, or move your spine into certain positions. People who have a herniated disc often experience numbness or tingling in the body part served by the affected nerves. Muscles served by the affected nerves tend to be weakened. This may cause you to stumble or impair your ability to lift or hold items. A bulging disc is usually the first condition to manifest before a rupture or herniation. They are also typical in the lower back, occurring when a weakened or deteriorated disc swells through a crevice in the spine, extending outside its normal space. As the disc moves, its inner liquid-like nucleus begins to balloon towards the weakest point. Bulging discs may also place pressure on nearby nerves, leading to serious discomfort and in some cases, severe and chronic pain. Muscle spasms and lower back pain may be evidence of a bulging disc in the lumbar region. Because this area holds so much of the upper body's weight, approximately 90% of all bulging discs occur in the lumbar spine. Discomfort can spread to the buttocks, thighs, and feet. When a bulging disc pressures the sciatic nerve, sciatica can result. This condition usually manifests as pain that emanates down one leg, but not the other. Pain or tingling in the neck, shoulders, arms, hands, or fingers can signal a bulging disc in the cervical region of the spine. As we age, our spinal discs break down or degenerate, which may result in degenerative disc disease in some people. These age-related changes include the loss of fluid in your discs. This reduces the ability of the discs to act as shock absorbers and makes them less flexible. Loss of fluid also makes the disc thinner and narrows the distance between the vertebrae. The jelly-like material inside the disc, nucleus, may be forced out through the tears or cracks in the capsule, which causes the disc to bulge, rupture, or break into fragments. Degenerative disc disease can take place throughout the spine, but it most often occurs in the discs in the lower back and neck. These changes are more likely to occur in people who smoke cigarettes and those who do heavy physical work. 
People who are obese are also more likely to have symptoms of degenerative disc disease. A sudden acute injury leading to a herniated disc, such as a fall, may also begin the degeneration process. As the space between the vertebrae gets smaller, there is less padding between them and the spine becomes less stable. The body reacts to this by constructing body growths called bone spurs or osteophytes. Bone spurs can put pressure on the spinal nerve roots or spinal cord, resulting in pain and affecting nerve function. The back is one area of the body that does not need a lot of attention. If you have injured yourself, there is usually no treatment required. It will heal itself within two to six weeks, depending on the severity of the injury. Always see your doctor for pain that does not go away or that is continually aggravated by work or other stresses. Back braces may be recommended to assist healing. Scoliosis is a curvature of the spine, more often known by the misshapen or in some cases the overaccentuated curves of the spine itself that those who are afflicted are usually born with. It however can be caused by other factors. Compensatory scoliosis is one example and muscular scoliosis another. Postural misalignments from injuries, compensation, or bad postural habits can lead to the misshaping of spinal vertebrae, which becomes a permanent change in the structure of the spine, leading to various conditions. Severe muscular imbalances can also lead to scoliosis conditions, from one side of the spine being pulled out of place by asymmetrical building of muscle at the articulating facets of the spine. According to the Department of Radiology at the University of Washington, scoliosis of greater than 25 degrees has been reported in about 1.5 out of 1,000 persons in the United States. Most curves can be treated non-operatively if they are detected before they become too severe. However, 60% of curvatures in rapidly growing prepubetal children will progress. Therefore, scoliosis screening is done in schools across America and several other countries. This screening is probably not necessary until the fifth grade. Beyond that point, boys and girls should be examined every six to nine months. Generally, curvatures less than 30 degrees will not progress after the child is skeletally mature. Once this has been established, scoliosis screening and monitoring can usually be stopped. However, with greater curvatures, the curvature may progress at about one degree per year in adults. In this population, monitoring should be continued. If scoliosis is neglected, the curves may progress dramatically, creating significant physical deformity and even cardiopulmonary problems with especially severe curves. Currently, scoliosis is treated successfully by spatial braces, electrical stimulation, surgery, or by combinations of these three techniques. Many muscles of the back and spine are neglected. They go without stretching, proper conditioning, or thought. It is valuable to get to know the various types of muscles of the back. The superficial muscles include the lavator scapulae. This illustration shows the action and attachments of this muscle. Latissimus dorsi. Pay special attention to the muscle attachments and action on the skeletal structure with this muscle. Serratus posterior. Serratus anterior. Splenus capitis. Rhomboids. Trapezius. And the sternocolloidal mastoid. Here is another illustration of the attachments for this muscle group. The deep muscles of the back can be broken down into these groups. The iliocostalis muscle groups, which have connections on either side of the spine in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar regions of the back. 
The longissimus muscle groups, which have connections in the same three sections of the spine and include the top of the neck in the capitis region. And finally, we have the semispinalis muscle groups, which have connections at the capitis, cervicis, and thoracis regions of the spine. If we go a little deeper, we will also find the rotators of the spine, the intertransversarius, the interspinalis, and the multifidus muscles, which are primary stabilizing muscles that aid in flexion and rotation. I will also include the quadratus lumborum here. For new students and teachers in martial arts, dance, and other highly technical athletics, a common issue arises that should be noted. Beginners often carry more tension than others and use more energy than anyone else because of the unfamiliarity of movement and differences in level of conditioning. Compensations are common and take time and routine correction to work out. These compensations are often referred to as beginner's paralysis. This is where a student strains and is overly rigid due to the extra effort of learning unfamiliar movement vocabulary. Tension locks up muscle groups and triggers spasms and knots. Knots occur with signal overload. Much like when your computer freezes up, signals can get confused when the muscle is overworked and locks up in a contracted position. Pressure and massage are often great ways to deal with knots. The pressure restricts blood flow to the affected muscle. No blood, no oxygen. As the cells struggle to adapt to the change in oxygen, they will relax and reset or reboot, much like a computer. Reoccurring knots and spasms are a problem for many individuals. Progressive relaxation techniques are some of the best ways to relieve this tension and help control excessive tension which leads to knots. Lab number seven, back, neck, and muscles. Identify muscle groups and with a partner, assess your posture. Look for misalignments, compare shoulder levels, and note the tilt of the head. Do you carry excessive tension in some areas of your back? Do you have a back injury? Discuss ways to help prevent aggravation so it can heal. Note any deviations in the spine by having a partner palpate the vertebrae. Aside from that, please leave a like and subscribe to this channel. I would also appreciate your comments. And if you really appreciate this content, I'd thank you to check out our Patreon page as well. Donating a little bit on a month-to-month -month basis really goes a long way in helping me create new content and of course getting equipment that will help me produce even better quality videos in the future. If you have friends or family who are studying these subjects in school, I hope you'll consider sharing this with them so that they could use it as a study guide. And that's it for now. Until next time, stay healthy.